Thank you for participating in this virtual conference where we will take a look at a mathematical study of the spread of disease with TI Inspire CX technology. I see that many of you are joining us for the first time. So we'd like to offer a special welcome if this is your first T-Cubed professional development webinar. We'd also like to thank everyone for being with us tonight. I, Stacey Thibodeau, will be your moderator for tonight. I have taught science for over 20 years, including Biology 1, Chemistry 1, and AP Chemistry 2. I've also taught biomedical science courses in the Project Lead the Way program. I love to use TI technology to assist me daily in teaching, data collection, and modeling mathematics concepts, linking them to science content. I'm happy to introduce our panelists tonight, Jackie Bono and Louise Chapman. Jackie has taught for 37 years, primarily chemistry and physics. She is currently retired and consults for Veneer Software since 1990 and Texas Instruments. Jackie is the author of the TI Forensics book. Thanks for being with us tonight, Jackie. I'm very pleased to be here. And our other panelist is Ms. Louise Chapman. Louise has been a high school science teacher for over 30 years after beginning her career instructing at the University of Georgia. She has taught every science course offered at the high school level. Louise is the Enviro STEM resource teacher in her district in Volusia County, Florida. Thanks for being with us tonight, Louise. It's a great pleasure. Hello to everyone. We are expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send questions to all panelists using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We will also send general messages in the chat window. This session is being recorded, and as a reminder, we will provide a link to this event's certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. Once the recording is available, if you would like to follow along with your handheld or software, and we hope you will, we recommend doing this with the recording so you can download the activities and pause and rewind the recording as necessary. We don't expect you will have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate in the WebEx menu, audio broadcast, and then click join. So I guess it's your turn, Jackie. I'm gonna turn the host over to you and feel free to share your screen. Thank you very much. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now, I hope, Stacy. I am, let's get the yes. right path. <laughs> All right. So um, this is built as a mathematical study of the spread of disease using the TI Inspire. When Louise and I first uh, presented it for T-Cubed International in Dallas, it was billed as, oh my, did you die? Um, and this is our contact information for both Louise and I. This PowerPoint um, presentation will be available after the session as a download. So you guys will have access to all of these slides as well. So you will have our contact information should you have any questions whatsoever. And one thing that I would just add, Jackie, is that we did not have a crystal ball and anticipate the state of the world for all those people who think we we knew it was coming. Yeah, no, this this was an interesting <laughs> presentation. We had no clue, although it does tie in with current events, uh, for sure. We were planning on doing a very hands-on activity and some analysis, and then exploring a TNS file. We've done our best to take that hands-on activity and um, show you how you can sort of do that online. So you could in fact do that with your students if you had to be remote or if by chance you had a flipped classroom at actually like the last webinar on Tuesday night. So that's our agenda for today. Louise, you want to go over these? Um, yes, um, we are. <laughs> well, we are looking at hands-on simulation of the spread of disease and we're going to do it in a non-hands-on way, but we're also going to explain how um, 
It was originally a wet lab or hands on, and then we've adjusted it now using two different ways. One, of course, is using the random number generator, which Jack and I will talk about. Um, there's also a handheld simulation and then an explanation of some extensions and some mitigation and some other opportunities using the TI uh, technology as well as um, the handouts will be available for all of the parts. So I'm willing we're back in brick and mortar school soon, you would be able to do it in the fall. So um, this activity actually first started when the spread of AIDS became a very hot topic in the very early 90s. And disease is spread by chance or intention. We are believing that the coronavirus is obviously by chance there are other diseases that spread by intention. We're exploring some of the forensic um, applications because you could purposely spread a disease. And those of you who remember the numbers series on TV, there were several activities on that series as well that dealt with the spread of disease. And we're going to try and chase it back to patient number one or the person who started the spread of the disease. Whoa, I just went way ahead. Okay. Yes. My computer is very active. Well, okay. Um, we'll look at data from our activity to find the source, and we'll explore those mitigating factors that um, Louise mentioned in order to speed up or slow down the spread of the disease. The scenario here is the tracking of the spread of disease within a class. And um, that class that we set up was a class of 31, and everyone would get a cup, that cup would either be clean with just water or else it'd be contaminated. And in the activity that we were talking about doing, one of the cups would have a base. The most common base that we would use is sodium hydroxide. So um, you would take a tray, uh, take some little Dixie cups, put numbers in those. Everybody gets a little bit of liquid in every cup and um, they need to remember their number. Now, it's very important that you know which number is contaminated and that that cup gets given out. So if you have too many cups and no one gets the contaminated cup, obviously this activity will not work because you will have nobody spreading the disease. Um, after they share their bodily fluids, they will write down the number. If you're doing this um, in an actual lab, you would write down the number of the person you shared with um, and then you would take a drop of your solution and you would put it on either a spot plate or a plate that looked like this. So imagine that you have your cup and I say find someone and share a bodily fluid and you swish your two cups together. Then you each take a um, pipette and you put a drop on the appropriate number. Now this would be a laminated sheet or it would be a sheet that had wax paper over it, or you could obviously use a spot plate. The purpose for this sheet is only so we can find out who that first case was. You don't really need the sheet other than that, um, but it is a way to trace it back. So the there, next, there would be one common one for um, each run. Right, each run. At the end, after we've shared our bodily fluids a number of times, you will walk around with some phenothaline and you put a drop in each cup. If the person is not infected, it would be the clear cup that you see on the right. If the person is infected, they will have a pink color that you see in either one of the other two cups. And obviously phenothaline is an indicator um, for that, uh, the presence of um, whatever uh, base, base. Is, yeah, in the water. So. It, and we're using phenolphthalein. I mean, you could use universal indicator. Or you could use pool indicator for that matter, just so long as you can tell if it's an acid or base. It doesn't matter what you use. And for those of you who haven't used phenolphthalein, it's very inexpensive, easy, and um, kids do really well with it. And you can get a really big bottle for like 12 bucks. Right. Yeah. And you only need a drop per cup, so it's, you right. don't need a lot. Okay. All right. So this is this chart here is very, very small print and I apologize for that, but this is how I simulated the sharing of cups. 
because we obviously can't hand you cups and have you share your bodily fluids. And so I made up an imaginary class of 31. This, spread, this Excel spreadsheet is also in the documents that you um, can get at the end. So if you were person number one, you would share with person number 22. If you're person number two, you share with person number 23 um, in the first sharing. And so this is just a way to track it. And after you share, then you write down on your data sheet who you shared with so that you can find out who, when you got infected, basically, and who started the whole process. And then this one here is, so I ran it through, and you will get the Excel spreadsheet you get. You see each sharing going out, so you see how it started. This is at the end. And at the end, the people who you see in yellow are infected. And that's after we've shared five times. So and that would be like modeling the indicator die. Basically, the white ones would be the equivalent of real clean cup. And the yellow ones are actually pink, but I didn't get a good pink color on my <laughs> spreadsheet. But yes, that's right, is, is basically what happened. Um, and so now if you think about that sheet I just showed you, you can see if we want to find out who has the first case, and, um, note the person number 31 shared with 18. So I'm going to go back here. Note the person number 31 here shared with 18. 18 is not infected. So that means 31 is not infected because if 31 was infected, then 80, 18 would have been infected. And you can trace that back step by step to figure out who was the primary case. And you can do that with the sheet that we're going to give you um, in the, when you work it out yourself with your kids. And let me say to you that the person that started it, um, was either 9 or 19. So when you get all the way back to the very beginning, it's either 9 or 19, and you can't tell who that was because we never take their, their initial drop. So it's either 9 or 19. I kind of like that idea because then it's not one kid who's getting blamed. Now, I used 31 cups. You don't have to use 31 cups. You can use whatever number of students and you if have. You have. If you have less students, students could take two or three cups. The other thing is that in forensics, we don't always, we aren't always able to point the finger at one person. So I do like the idea that it's potentially two people that started. Yes, yes. It, it, it's, especially if they're young students, it's really, really very helpful that that's the case. Um, we're talking about using phenothaline, which is a really easy, cheap um, reagent. It is a little bit dangerous if you have students, just as an FYI. It is the active ingredient in Exlax. So if your students do this lab, please make sure they don't suck their thumbs or fingers afterwards because they're Jackie, we issues. did have a couple people mention that cabbage juice would work well. Also. Cabbage juice would also work. Cabbage so that would be an alternative for younger children. It would be. Um, there's a whole lot of natural um, dyes that would work and do it. You can use rose petals as well. You can use turmeric. There's mm -hmm. a lot of natural indicators. You can use blueberries, yeah. but yeah. And cabbage juice is kind of fun because you could have the kids make their own. And there's many ways to get cabbage juice. I mean, you can boil it, you could extract it from other things. If you happen to have Rainier sensors, you could do this same activity and you could use an, a sensor plugged into your Inspire. So um, these are actually taken in Louise's lab. I don't have, my building was locked down, so I, I couldn't get into the I, I have a portable out in the county park that's open, so I was able to get in and set it up. But you could use either the pH sensor, um, which is fine, or you could use the um, salinity oh, sensor, it. which is, well, I, I had a salinity, and that works mm -hmm. really well. I mean, conductivity also would work. Any one of those sensors and um, we kind of walk around with it, um, and, and we have lab tables there, which are basically... The only cool. thing you need to be a little bit careful of, folks, is if you're doing it with sensors, make sure you wash off the sensors in between going into the cups, obviously. And notice here, this is, so this is the TI Inspire. Just so you know, it can also be done with the 84. 
This is something called an Easy Link, which plugs into the mini USB at the top of your Inspire. And then this is the Vernier sensor, and it must be a Vernier sensor. It can't be another company sensor in order to work with a oh, DI calculator. And if you're doing conductivity, you can use the sodium hydroxide or soap, any, any base, or you could also use salt in this case. So you could And this is my conductivity salt. sensor, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but so any of these would do the right. same thing. And also I will point out if you're not used to using sensors, on the right hand side is the result of sitting the sensor in the cup. <laughs> so oh, make yeah. sure they hold on to it. <laughs> yes. it yes. <laughs> um and then this one here is the pH sensor. Again, the same thing. And this is when you plug the sensor into an inspire, this screen will automatically pop up. The program is, is preloaded into your inspire and it's Vernier's data quest. If you happen to have a lab quest from Vernier, it works very much the same way. Um, and you are only going to use it as a meter. So all you want to do is know the number. You don't, you're not going to collect any other data. You're only going to use it as a meter. It's one of the functions of the um, handheld. Now, if you're a math teacher that doesn't have sensors, you can either borrow them from, from science or you can test it with cheap pH paper and then record it in a table in your Inspire. Right. Right. And that, and that again, the, the nice thing with that is the talking of math and science people together. I mean, that's, that's really kind of um, good science and, and good STEM going on. Another way to do it, if you can't do it using the spreadsheet, well, like, so first way to do it is obviously to wet lab it and actually use the cups. If, you, if the kids are home and you can't do that, up in New England, we have other days that, that are work at home days because we have snow days, where I, I know some parts of the country don't have that. Um, <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah, we have hurricane days. Yeah. Um, you could do the spreadsheet that I showed you. And then the third way to do it, if you needed to, or if your students were home like they currently are, is you could use a random number generator and then just generate the number of infected cases, so to speak. And that's what this is. It's a random number generator. I'm going to actually do these steps for you in a couple of minutes on the Inspire, but I just wanted to put it in here. So it's a random integer, and I had 31 people in the class. And so this is my high, this is my low, and this is how many random numbers I wanted. Now, in my case, I have something blocking my screen right here, so you can't see the whole slide. But as I come down here, you'll notice I then did another one. So now we have two people that are infected. These two people infected two more. So we would have those two plus these. So I would now have four people infected, which is why that's four. They infected these four. So I now have eight people infected. The reason that this is 13 is that some of these numbers are repeated from up here. Mm -hmm. Some of which you can't see because this is in the way. Um, so. <laughs> So that what happens is, is, is we go to 13 because of the repeated numbers and, and it goes on. Whoa, whoa. excuse me. Go okay. back. Yeah, we're down here. Let me just do it this way. Maybe. Oh. Okay. Um, while she's Sorry. getting back to it, yeah. um, I will tell you that um, you, you can easily try a variety of ways, and we're going to show you some other ways as well, but um, you might even try the random number approach and the cup approach, and then see if you come up with the same information. Right, because, right. Because the kids yeah. expect that the outbreak is very predictable, and obviously we can't predict, and depending on the type of, of outbreak. You can run you can run the cups in two different classes on the same day of the same size and get slightly different numbers. It depends upon if kids share with a student who's already been infected or don't. Or if two infected people share, then they don't get more infected. So you get slightly different numbers each time you run it. it it's very interesting to watch how the dynamics of that go. If you have a very large class, you'll see that you'll get infections within pods of kids. So we did it with a group of 100 one time, and we had test stations. And we saw that you got that exponential growth, actually logistic growth, 
um, within a group. <laughs> and then once it dropped, jumped over to group the second group, that same spread happened within that second group. So it's interesting to watch how that spread works. And one thing you can do is you can keep the information, and I'll do it by a class period and then over the whole day to see right. the difference. And there are differences. Noticeable differences there are, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then what would happen is, and again, remember, you've got the handouts to do that. Um, the kids would actually, and I will show you this on the Inspire, um, the kids will actually put in the run what the ideal is. So if I start with two, it would go to four, it would go to eight, it would go to 16, it would go to 32. If you look at those random numbers that I just had, it actually does two, four, eight, 13, and 20. Um, and then of course they can graph it. So it would look like this. Obviously ideal in the sense of logistic growth, not in the sense of human being. Well, actually, that. actually the ideal is exponential. Right. In fact, yeah, the infected is logistic. Right. But what I'm saying is we're not wanting this to happen. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, and this is what happens with no mitigation whatsoever. We've been very aware of mitigation in this country over the past couple of months. And so, um, oh, crap. So I didn't have this noted on my slide. I'm sorry. So, so one of the... Uh, mitigations is hand washing um, or the spread of disease and hand washing and the spread of disease by touching or contact as opposed to just aerial and so Louise has this stuff you want to and so I just thought this would be interesting because if you don't have it you can order it and there are two things one is glow germ powder and I put it on my doorknob and the kid that comes in replaces the cups you don't even have and I say to that kid, the first kid, okay, you're number one, and I give everybody a number. And then they walk around the room touching, and you can then, so that's the glow germ powder. And then the other is glow germ soap. And so the powder is on the right. You can see it on the surface. And people are at, always asking me, how long will the virus, the coronavirus, last on plastic? And so you can actually track length of time of of the glow that's a little tiny two inch uh uv black it's a black light flashlight they cost about five bucks and the soap you scrub and you scrub and where you see it in the middle where it actually glows is after you've washed your hands a bunch and you use the black light and walk around the room you can actually see that most people still have the virus under their fingernails and in various places on their hands. So people who just don't believe in uh, cleaning the surfaces, cleaning groceries when they bring them home, they don't use a nail brush or a real scrubbing material to wash their hands, may be indeed transmitting germs. And I thought it would be sort of interesting for you to see because the earlier stuff showed us density dependent, which is why they say no more than 10 in a room, you know, as soon as you get to 100 or 20 or 30 in a room, you're going to spread it. Well, the same thing with this, and it's very inexpensive, but it also goes along with it. And um, it might be great for math teachers because it doesn't make a mess and you don't see it until you use the black light. Well, and it's really good for elementary kids. I mean, the idea of washing their hands and everything, I mean, so, so it carries a lot of other use, too. Um, they use it in nursing schools a lot too, which is kind yeah. of scary. Yeah. Well, it's to teach it's to teach doctors and nurses why they use certain scrub all the way to the elbow. And so, um, how can you mitigate? We can. Well, there are several ways to mitigate. One is vaccination. In the model we're talking about, was using a, basically a base as our contaminant. If some of the cups contained a buffer, for example we would see that those buffers did not change when we added the base to it. So consequently, we would sort of take them out of the mix of spreading the disease. And obviously, they then wouldn't go forward and spread the disease. Social distancing, we could mimic um, in or model it in our cup sharing idea. If let's just say that every fifth person skipped a share or two of, of um, their bodily fluids, then what we would see is those numbers dramatically 
go down, which is, is what we're seeing. And then, of course, the hand washing, which um, is a dilution. It's, it's not a uh, total, you know, doing away with, as Louise just showed you. But, well, um, and part of that is people believe that um, hand sanitizer and scrubbing soap, it is not the back antibacterial materials in the soap. It's the actual friction that kills viruses and bacteria. So, um, you know, as much as we say use hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer is primarily against bacteria. So it's an interesting thing too. Well, it has, and it also has to do with denaturing the, the outer shells. I mean, the, between the soap right. and the alcohol and the sanitizer. So now we want to show you some stuff on the actual Inspire. Are there any questions we have to hit right now or are we in good shape? I Anything? think we're in good shape. Um, I will say to a couple of people that were asking, um, if you're interested, uh, Bill Gates has a really great TED talk from about a year and a half ago on, on the prediction of this kind of virus, the, of a respiratory virus that you're asymptomatic for a period of time before you get it. And it has some really great uh, applications to using the TI technology to show some of that. So if you get a chance, look for that TED talk. All right, so this is the TI Inspire. I'm using the teacher software. I'm using the premium teacher software. Just so you know, TI has made the software available to you for free and to all of your students for free. So if your students are home and they didn't take a TI Inspire home with them, or you don't have enough for all of your kids to use at home, you can use the software. And that's actually what I'm using right now is the TI software. So I've opened up a new document and I'm going to add a calculator page. And this is how I'm going to do the random integer piece for you folks. And so this is just the calculator page. I'm going to go to this book. I call it my Bible. It's my favorite key. But the thing I like about it is that it gives me all of um, the functions that I can use. And then on the bottom, it gives me cheat notes as to um, how to do it. And I never know how to do it. So this tells me how to do it. And you'll notice on the bottom, it's actually backwards from what I did. Um, you'll notice on the bottom, it talks about low bound, um, upper bound, and then the number of trials. If you want them, the fact that it's in brackets means that part of it is optional. So if you hit enter, it puts the function for you. And then I did, it says, and if you forget what it says, you can just go back and flick on it. And it says low up and then number of trials. And so I'm going to follow that. I'll hit escape now to get out of here. So it's low. My low is one comma. Upper is 31 comma. And the number of trials, the first time I did one. And you can't see it because of this box. No, I can see so That it. was number 26. All yes. right. Now I want to repeat it. So person number 26 is infected. I want to go back up and I want to um copy that again and let's see who 26 is going to infect so if i hit if i highlight it if i hit it it copies for me and i can edit it so i want to hit one more person let's see who they hit so they hit 20. so right now 26 and 20 are infected if i go up again hit enter let's go over here Change and it's that all one on the to two. Okay. Hit enter, and they um, contaminate seven and thirty-one. All right. So now I have four people contaminated. So let's go over here. Change that two to a four. Hit enter, and now I have these four people. So now you will notice that I have eight unique numbers. So I'm gonna do the same thing again. I find it tedious, not kids don't, but, and I should start to get repeats. So notice that 10 is a repeat. Notice that 20 is a repeat. Notice that 31 is a repeat. Um, so now, rather than going to 16, like I would have, at least those three numbers are repeats. Is there any other? So I think no. I want to go to, I think I go this time to 13. Mm -hmm. All right, and so this is the way 
that you get your random numbers um, generated. These people are infected. You'll get something very similar to the spreadsheet. What we'd then like to do is we'd like to graph it, and we would like to make that little chart like I showed you um, previously. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a page. I did Control Doc to add a page, and I'm going to add a list of spreadsheets. And this one here is going to be my the contact. No, it's going to be, yeah, contact. And then it's going to be ideal. Notice, please, that I'm typing in the very top. It's much easier on the computer than on the handheld in my mind. <laughs> um, and then it's going to be actual. Okay, and then over here it was one, where am I here, two, three, four, five, six, and the nice thing about the Inspire is, by the way, your lists don't have to be the same number. The ideal here, obviously, is one, and then I come over, and then the ideal here is one in, one is two, and it's four, it's eight, it's 16, it's 32. And it just keeps, this is also assuming that one person affects only one person. When I did the random numbers previously, over here I had two, four, eight, two, four, eight, now, no, I think it was one, two, four, eight. That's it. This number here has to be one. And then it was 20. What? The nice thing about the random 13. number generating that I, that I like is that you can do a whole lot of ones and kids can see what happens in the time. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of really good stuff you could do. Now, if we were to graph this, and folks, I'm going to graph it um, using a data and stats page, which is what um, a lot of people really like. Those of you who haven't seen this, this is a really neat page. Um, and on the bottom down here, I get to, I just click on it, and it's going to be contact. It's love them, them moving like that. And then over here, it's going to be ideal. And that, so that's what the data would look like ideally. If I want to put in the actual, if I come over to, let's see if I can remember how I'm doing this now, I'm going to come over to menu, and I'm going to come over to, what am I going to come over to? <laughs> Actions, I think. I wrote it down in our mistake. Nope. I'm going to come over there. I'm going to add a Y variable. I went to plot properties. I'm going to add a Y variable. And then I'm going to put it in um, actual. And I can see the plot of what actually happened. Now notice I'm kind of um, coming in less than the ideal. I'm flattening the curve, so to speak. I'm getting less <laughs> than predicted. And so the kids can do that kind of stuff um, right within the Inspire. And, and graphing it. I can then do, if I wanted to, I can do the analysis, I can get the logistics curve for the actual, and I can get the exponential curve for the ideal, if you wanted to do that, depending upon the level of student you have. And folks, there is a handout um, that you can download. It's who yes, started she's already it shared, uh, Casey's already shared the link to the series. Okay, it's called Who Started It All? Unfortunately, when I printed this off of the um, website, when I got it from the website, the teacher page is up first, and then the student activity. So just pay a little bit of attention to that. Okay, so that's on the Inspire. And there's also a really other neat TNS file that you can download. It's called the Spread of Disease. And so Louise and I, um, <laughs> when we we're gonna present in, in Dallas at yeah. TSU, um, we had decided that we were going to do this, and Corona wasn't around at the time, but we were going to do this with a spread of disease. 
and we wanted to take the old zombie, which isn't that old, the zombie activity and sort of make it generic. The problem we had is that some of this stuff is hidden. So if John Hanna is on, I want to give a big thank you to John Hanna because John Hanna allowed me to change labels on graphs that I couldn't change. In one case, it was because they were in Lua, and he actually wrote the programming behind the scenes of the Lua. That's in problem two. And in the other case, there's a hidden spreadsheet. So some of it you can tweak and some of it you can't. It's <laughs> locked down. But you could actually go in this um yourself and change some of it so if you were a bio teacher as we go through some of this i'll show you where you could actually go in and change the text and really make it more relevant for your kids so those of you who um, have inspires you can send these files out very easily if you have a navigator it's easy if you don't have a navigator you send it to one kid from your computer and they share just like they share diseases um, and it goes very quickly within your class just as the disease will so this is um, the spread of disease, and this is a virus. You can change that picture. I mean, I just went and grabbed a picture and put it in. <laughs> yes, um, you could pull Corona for a Corona. Yeah, it's a slightly yeah. different picture for Corona. Right. Um, and it's a virus outbreak has been discovered. Um, ep ep what are they called? Epidemiologists. Epidemiologists are trying to figure out what to do to stop the outbreak. Um, many modes of transmission, depending upon the mode needed, will affect how fast it spreads. This virus is airborne, we're saying it's being transported by saliva drops and other individuals. So as a biologist, Jackie, mm -hmm. the Corona-19 is an airborne saliva uh, yep. one. And mm -hmm. the other thing is that if you're not a science person, you're more math, one thing you should know about viruses is if they can take off their entire outer coat, so think of it as your winter coat and winter attire, and now they have another coat underneath, so viruses can change and mutate into other viruses, hence the 19, just so that you understand where that came from. And then I'm just going from page to page on this. Um, as with all, it is assumed the virus started with one person becoming infected. And then in this particular case, they're saying that each person affects two people per week. They're saying that corona actually if you put a person with coronavirus in a room, they would typically spread the disease to three, where believe it or not, the measles spreads to seven. So actually measles are more infectious. infectious. The thing with measles is that we have vaccines against them and we have some built-in immunity because they've been around for so long. The problem with corona, of course, is neither one of those two things is true. And so what happens is we watch it grow. If we come over here, this is how many people would get infected over a period of time with a number of weeks. Um, they, huh? It is related to 2019 when it first appeared, but it is believed that there were other iterations of this virus. Um, but it probably appeared longer before, earlier than 2019. Jackie, I did want to mention one thing about that graph. Yep. For people who are not mathematical, every time I try to explain what flattening the curve means, this might be a really good way for you to demonstrate, even in a faculty meeting or a team meeting with a group of people, what it means to flatten the curve and why you want a flatter curve. Well, if you flatten the curve, then this here just doesn't go up. It becomes logistics. It's kind of like carrying capacity. So what happens is, is then it comes over here. We're still growing. The state of Connecticut is a great example. I mean, we've theoretically flattened the curve and the governor says, oh, isn't this great? You know, we have 41 less people in the hospital. Yeah, but we still have, I, I don't know how many, over a thousand people actively in the hospital right now. And it's, and it's um, we're down 41 cases, but that's because 89 people died and so we still added more people to the hospitals, but um, it's not going up as fast as they expected it to. And so that in itself is biologically is significant. Right. Um, and, and that is the ultimate goal because with viruses, which are not treatable with medication, um, that's the best we can do until we zero the curve. Right. And, and so what's happening is it's coming over here. Um, and then going on to the next page here, 
So what happened is this is the TNS file, and if you have a navigator system, you oftentimes build questions in. These questions, I also um, gave you a, actually a copy of the TNS file as a PDF file um, that you can download. So you can actually see it page by page. If I were doing this and I wasn't going to collect it electronically because I didn't have a navigator, there's no reason why these kids couldn't ask the questions, um, answer the questions on a sheet of paper. And it, the greatest rate of infection occurred between, what, two weeks, um, looking mm -hmm. back at that graph. The next one is using the graph, the rate of infection appears to be very close to zero because of the scale. It talks about um, and we'd have to we'd have to fix the number of zombies because obviously this is from uh, oh, zombie, yes. zombie apocalypse. But we will you can edit so you can yes. change. So I could just go back over here. Mm -hmm. Literally, folks, on your um, page, it's the number of infected. Right. And if I, I save this, here, now it's saving it, and it will be infected instead of zombies. So you have the ability to do that without any problem. And that's one of the beauties of the strength of the inspire is that you can create these questions. They can be relevant to your grade level, to the content. Um, and you can use it in advanced classes. And of course, the questions can be certainly a higher order. So. And, and the bottom line is, is that I don't want to tell you how many people have read this. In this file, and how many times? <laughs> but those kinds of things can easily be fixed when you find them. So it's it's not the end of the world should you make a mistake like that. You can fix it for the next time. And then this here is another spread of disease, and all of this contains the original data. This graph is three and four. <laughs> and you know what I should do is this. Okay, so this is going on. Notice that this spreads it out more. This is the next question. What is happening with the rate of after week 30? So if I go here. So you, what would you think would happen? Well, eventually you're expecting it to level off because eventually everybody's going to have it. So even if you don't mitigate it, this will burn itself out because everybody will have it. So there'll be no more. Um, infection increasing is what's going Unless on. it can reinfect the same. Unless it mutates too. Right. And so one of the things that they're doing right now, for those of you who may not be aware, and she's talking about virulence, which is the next thing. All right, you want to talk about it? Um, sure. So we've been looking at virulence in this particular um, disease that's running rampant now, and people are donating their platelets to see that it had it, to see if they have immunity and they can offer immunity, which would then allow us to develop vaccines, or whether they will be reinfected. So so the higher, the, higher the virulence, if my understanding is correct, because I'm not a bio person, the higher the virulence, the more rigid the, the virus is or the stronger the virus is? Yeah, the harder it is to um, fight, yeah. Okay. So, so eventually the more the virulent, the greater the spread, generally the, um, the tougher. It, it reminds me a bit of like when you had chicken pox and you hear about shingles, you know, how virulent is it? And you were saying measles, measles is pretty virulent. Okay. So, so this one here has a, has a virulence of one. And if I play this, the red dots are people getting infected. And you can see how that's working, and you can see this graph go on. And what I love about this is if you notice, the density of the population matters. So the people that are all clustered in near the person with the virus tend to get it more quickly on the further part. So if you live in Montana in a town of 200, it's probably more socially isolated than I am here in Daytona Beach where the beach is still open. And so what you'll notice on the next page is that the, as the number of infected go up, the number of, it should say, humans are uninfected go down because there are less people 
available because there's only a total number of people that you can have. Um, if I come back to this page for a moment, and if I change this virulence here to two, let's reset it, okay, let me go up to three, and you'll notice what happens now. So the kids can actually play with this. And what you could do is have different kids do different virulences and compare their graphs. And you can see how much faster this one is spreading. And over on this graph over here, you'll see this moves to a lesser time. Now, time is not days or months or years. It's just time. It's kind of an arbitrary unit right now. And again, it can go up. I can reset this. And I can bring this up even further. Back up here. OK. And then I can hit it again. So several of the calculus people are seeing the parts where they can use the logistic differentials in BC. And, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of cool. It also relates to if people are asymptomatic or symptomatic. And the fact that some viruses are asymptomatic, like measles, until you break out in the rash and you're much more contagious for the two or three days before you break out in the rash, and also all right, so then again, there are some questions. These questions you can either type out or copy um, if you wanted to, or not ask. If you didn't want to, you can quite literally drop this slide, and the slide wouldn't be there before you sent it out. Um, it says that the x axis or the independent variable has no unit on it, um, it's just time. It could be days, it could be weeks. Um, in the current the virus, they're talking about, you know, how many days it takes to double the number of cases. So those units, whatever those units are, is, is what they're talking about. And it may be different for different places. Um, and again, there's a few more questions here, some of which are good, some of which you would care about and not. It talks about is, the, is it direct or inverse, if you want to talk about some math people. Um, at the end of it, here it talks about the CDC with, um, Developing vaccines to combat virus. Again, this was before this all came out, folks. Um, and how do vaccines work? Talk with another student about this. Then it asks the kids to think of some of the other diseases they've had. You know, have they had a whole lot of them? We added another part. It's called question three or problem three. But this would be asking the students to, in fact, choose a disease that they want to investigate, get some data on that. And they would actually type in whatever disease it is that they're investigating. It doesn't say that it has to be a virus. I mean, you could put the parameters on that you wanted. I could imagine a kid, you know, investigating measles. So obviously, they could investigate the coronavirus. If they were in their humanities class, you know, talking about the Spanish flu or the plague or something, it could be almost any disease they want to investigate. They then take and, and enter some notes on that. And then they get some data on that disease and graph it. And if you are a math teacher and you are interested, College Board has a really good Spanish flu from the perspective of the doctor, the soldier, the thing. but it has great data and how they sent everybody out to celebrate the end of it. And in that parade by the next day, they were, you know, within two days, there were thousands of people. This, this activity lends itself to some other thoughts, too, and, and I think because, you know, Connecticut's right in the thick of it where I am, um, it would be a real interesting study if I had a group of kids, and let's just say they decided to do the coronavirus, they decided to do the same virus, and I looked at what happened to the numbers in nursing homes, and somebody else looked at what happened to numbers in prisons, and somebody else looked at the numbers, you know, in another population. It might be really, really interesting to see how that data changes because that data is out there. I mean, we get updates literally every day, you know, here so in the state. This year, and I must have been, I don't know, prophetic. In addition to this, if you need a place to generate data and then put it into your Inspire, there is a, a game called Pandemic 
that's yeah. available online from Walmart. If you have it, and it's the spread of it's viral disease all over the world, and it shows you what parts of the world you can predict, and you can use the um, graph that you generate on Inspire to predict which parts of the world, where the spread would be fastest, where the density of people is greatest. And so it might be a useful thing for you and science people to add to it to go along with all the great technology because it gives you some really good background stuff. Yeah, and, the, and they're talking now, I mean, I, I read today about um, the disease into being spread into rural America and how that those dynamics are very, very different than the disease spreading, you know, in New York City and in the general metropolitan area around it. I mean, there's just a whole lot of, of good stuff that you could have kids do with, a, uh, I think, with this with a oh, too, too much work. And I think the kids would like it. I think it's it's relevant to them. They saw it. It's It's something that they could relate to. Do we have any questions? Anybody have any questions or um, comments? Can you see the chat, Louise? I don't see the chat. I can see the chat. Yes. Uh, I don't see. I see some comments that were very good, but um, and they were talking about you know number one is the initial, and then we do how many runs and all of that, but. There's nothing that's a specific question. Um, well, you, you theoretically want to do enough runs so that if the ideal happens, everybody would be infected. I mean, that's, that's how you sort of indirectly determine your runs. And once you get up there, you know, once we had, um, at one point, the ideal said that we would have, um, let me get back to page one here. Well, the, the other idea. thing is, if they're not all infected, which happens a lot in viruses, some of you have a much stronger immune system. I'm, I mean, you know, I'm one of those at-risk people. So if you're not, you may be in a room. For, I, when I was young, my parents would take me to my cousins when they had chicken pox and measles and whatever. So I would get it, um, that herd idea. But you could either see everybody get it or someone would have a much lesser case than others. I know Chris Cuomo in his family, they were showing the different, they thought it might even be different strains, but it was just different ways they responded. But as far as, 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 far as the number of, of runs you need to do or contacts you need to do, I mean, at, at the end of six contacts, theoretically, I could have 32 people infected. Most yeah. of our classrooms, that would be the entire class. Now, you're not going to have everybody infected because of the way they share, but um, that would be the most. So if I had a bigger group, it would only take one more run for that to go to 64. And so, so we also have to point out that that's why brick and mortar schools are closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And to reduce that spread. That's yeah, to, to reduce the spread. And, and again, there are mitigating ways. To, to do that, and some of that is really, really working. Okay, um, I'm not very well. We see in the chat, and I don't know, chat is your name, Chaco? I hope I'm saying it right. Um, there's actual data um, on the CDC sites, but I should point out that your state and your governor may have it. The problem is current data, if you're looking for this particular virus, uh, there's a lot of false negatives, and also, like in my state, we are not reporting the number of assisted living deaths. They just don't want them reported, so they're not reporting. But if you're looking for the spread of cases, um, depending on where you live, you can go right online and, and the CDC or the National Institute of Health have really good sites with actual data. And, and in the state of states where it's, it's really a hot spot, I mean, we're getting releases from the um, the state literally every day at four o'clock. Those I think are everyone is pretty yeah. much every state, even whether or not. They're I'm just saying, if you want true actual data, that's where. Well, I the problem go. the problem with this one is is that we just don't know how many people really are infected. I mean, that's that's the other piece. I mean, we don't know. It's not as clear as putting phenolphthalein in a cup and it turns pink. <laughs> Um, because, yeah, not not everybody is being tested. 
And so the numbers jump when more people are tested, but that, that's giving you a truer number. So, I mean, there are places that testing just isn't being done. So you just don't know, or you only can get tested if it's um, symptomatic. Um, um, but again, you know, although I did this in the Inspire, and that TNS file that I showed you with the zombies actually is available on, on the 84 as well. It's not as easy, but it, it's also available on the 84. So although we highlighted Inspire, um, it can be done on the 84. And those of you who, you know, have students at home without calculators, the 84 has a similar program that's free. It's called SmartView. And they also have an app for the Chromebooks for the 84 that's free. There's also an app for an iPad that's actually the Inspire that right now is free. So TI has really gone above and beyond to make it so that this is accessible to your students. So we have a couple of questions. One is um, the TI uh, website, does it carry the free software? Eric, do you want to handle that one or do you want to? Okay. Um, um, and also, they're also saying John Hopkins University of Medicine has got good data. Um, yeah, any of the reliable medical sources. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. I mean, okay. So I'm trying to give this back to you, and I can't Stacey. seem to do. Stacy, thank you, and thank you all. Yeah, I'm trying yes, to get. Thank you, thank you, ladies, so much. Um, to answer the question about the free software for students to download, mm -hmm. um, I did put the link in the chat window earlier. Um, if you go to education.ti.com, there's a teacher premium software, there's a student software, there's links for the TI Inspire app for the iPad, and then there is also a um, link to fill out a form that can get the students the TI-84 Chromebook um, extension and that may be different in your district on how that's um, actually allowed to to happen um, so thank you guys Lee ladies did a great job um, thank you so much for for all your work um, real world application um, allowed people to see how you can take a science lab science equipment and then bring it into a technology based lesson and then also bring it into a real world problem um, as you guys, as we are here nearing the end of tonight's webinar, make sure if you have any questions or comments for Louise and Jackie, you put it in the chat. They'll try to answer. Um, when you leave tonight, you will receive um, an email in a couple of days of a link to the recording. I've also posted in the chat window a link to a certificate of attendance and also a link to the documents from tonight. Certificate is printed in English, although the interface shows other languages, um, but you are more than welcome to download it and use it as you need. You will also receive an email um, about a survey af right after this session. So if you could please send us your um, suggestions for upcoming webinars or ideas that you have for more sessions, just like tonight. If for some reason you need more information, um, TI Cares is your a tech-friendly um, organization that can answer uh, qu customer questions, maybe customer support, technical reps, 1-800-TI-CARES or ti-cares at ti.com. And they really do listen to teachers. Um, next week, we're gonna have another session, uh, still a virtual conference. Next week, May 5th, we're gonna look at functional art, creating pictures by transforming functions. We're going to connect math and art together. So like I said, uh, great job tonight, ladies. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you for all of your hard work. Um, I know it's it's different taking time out of your busy schedule um, to come up with a virtual conference session and trying to make it as user friendly as possible of what you would do, like Louise said, in brick and mortar, but also incorporate the technology um, and also giving us a real world application um, to what we're dealing with currently. And thank you guys, all of you, for joining us tonight. We appreciate you guys being here. Thank you, Stacey, thank for you. all your hard work. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it was Good a night, great huh? night.